So we've had a little look at freehold covenants and we had a little bit of an introduction to freehold covenants in the previous video. And in this video, we're going to begin talking about enforcing covenants. So we're going to be looking at two specific principles in this video before looking at the specific means that we can pass the burden of a covenant in the two successors entitled in the next video before finishing off our videos on covenants in the following video where we talk about passing the benefit to successors in title. But today we're going to be fo focusing on just these first two principles which we'll get into in just a moment. So principle one, enforcing the covenant in an action between the original covenant tour and the original covenant T. As a covenant is a contract, the covenant T may sue a covenant tour at law or equity, and this reflects the privity between the original covenant T and the covenant tour. However, because the benefits and burdens of certain types of covenants are transmissible to subsequent owners of both the original covenant tours and the original covenant in T's land, a number of different situations must be identified. And so we're going to go through at each of them with respect to enforcing the covenant in an action between the original covenant tour and the original covenant T. So if both the original parties to the covenant are in possession of their respective land, then the matter is relatively straightforward. They can sue in both law or in equity. That's all we need to know about that, okay? So if they're both still in possession of their respective lands, they can go down the legal or the equity route to sue. The next situation is after the original covenant tour has parted with the burden land. So if the original covenant tour has left, he still remains liable to the covenant tea. However, the claimant in this situation will usually want the covenant performed, so will probably want to take on the person who's actually in possession of the burdened land. So consequently, a remedy against the original covenantor, who is no longer in possession of the land, is of little practical use, unless this is the only person against whom there is a realistic chance of a remedy and where damages are acceptable. The next situation is after the original covenant T has parted with the benefited land. So if the covenant T has parted, he may still be able to enforce a covenant against whoever has the burden of it. So this is often, in most cases, not very successful because you know, if the court was to award anything, the damages would be nominal as they wouldn't really face a loss because they're no longer you know they're no longer in possession of the benefited land and in equity the court is likely to use its discretion to refuse to give any equitable remedy and the next situation is where the original covenant tour having had no land at all at the time the covenant was given so a covenant tour even if he never had any land burdened by the covenant, is liable on a covenant at law, but not in equity. This is because the contractual nature of the obligation is not dependent on the original covenant or holding any estate in land. Therefore, in Smith and Snipes Hall Farm from 1949, the defendant, who was the covenant tour, was liable for a positive covenant to repair and maintain riverbanks, even though he had no land himself, due to the contractual nature of the promise. So a covenant is, after all, an in personam contractual promise, breach of which entails liability at law. So how can we define the original covenant tour and covenant T? Usually, this is quite simple. It's usually quite simple to identify the original parties to the covenant, these being those persons named in the covenant and having signed it in the presence of a witness. However, Section 56 of the Law of Property Act 1925 may also operate to extend the range of original covenantees, those who enjoy the benefit, although not the covenantors, those who bear the burden, 
beyond those who are actually parties to the deed. So, you know, this section in the Law of Property Act may extend the number of people who are, are benefiting from the original covenant, but it won't extend those who are in, who are burdened by the original covenant. So what does this section actually say? It says the following. A person may take an immediate or other interest in land or other property or the benefit of any condition, right of entry, covenant or agreement over or respecting land or other property, although he may not be named as a party to the conveyance or other instrument. So in 99% of the time, you will look at the conveyance, it will refer to the parties to the covenant, and that will be it. But section 56 operates to extend this to cases where the parties are not explicitly named in the instrument itself. So you need to be thinking that we may well have, if the wording of the instrument, the covenant allows it, someone being part of the covenant, despite not being explicitly named. And then subsection two, a deed between parties to affect its objects has the effect of an indenture, though not indented or expressed to be an indenture. Don't worry about that part so much. So really, the important thing is, is that section 56 allows us to sort of extend the covenant to include parties that are not named specifically within the covenant, the instrument itself. So the inclusion of additional covenantees. So section 56 may operate to include additional parties as covenantees where the conveyant was intended to confer this benefit on the person as a party. So they have so they've intended to confer a benefit as a party. The benefit must be made with them, not merely for them. Okay, that's the important point that's probably being made here. For example, in AMS prop trading and Harris distribution. You'll said that the point is not enough that the persons are intended to take a benefit. They must be intended to be a party, okay? okay? And that's why I have bolded out the word party here, okay? The second situation where Section 56 may operate to include additional parties as covenantees is where the person concerned was in existence and identifiable at the time the covenant was agreed. So the beneficiary cannot be, you know, for, for instance, your unborn son. It must be someone in existence at the time the covenant was agreed. Okay, so let's look at the second principle. Enforcing the covenant against successors entitled to the original covenant tour, passing the burden. Okay, so proprietary obligations. Since the landmark case of Tolk and Moxay in 1848, Covenants have been recognised, in addition to being personal and contractual obligations, as capable of being proprietary in REM as well. So this case meant covenants could run with the land. In this case, the covenant was an obligation not to build on Leicester Square in London, which was enforced against the defendant when the defendant was not the original covenantor, but a purchaser from him. So... This case meant a covenant can be enforced against a defendant where the defendant is not the original covenant or but a subsequent assignee or purchaser. So if the various conditions that I'm going to discuss in the next video are satisfied, a covenant can be enforced not only against the original covenant or but also against anyone who comes into possession or occupation of the land burdened by the covenant. Insofar as the obligation is a proprietary one, and so may lie against the land rather than any one person, it may amount to severe limitations on the uses to which the land might be put, and so, in turn, very significantly affect its value. As such, the law requires that precise criteria be met before the burden can be set to run in line with the doctrine in Tolk. And this is exactly what I'm going to be talking about in the next video. We're going to be talking about how we can pass the burden to successors in title. So as soon as you've watched this video, I would highly recommend you check out my next video on that. If you have any questions about this video, make sure you leave a comment below and I'll get straight back to you. And make sure you subscribe to my channel for more law videos. Thank you very much for watching.